have the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Uh, John Sebastian Holman as uh, our guest. Uh, uh, and Se Sebastian uh, is uh, a postdoc at uh, Roskilde uh, University in Denmark, and he is a part of the research group for criminal justice ethics uh, there. Uh, and I have known a couple of people, including himself, uh, there for a few years, as well as, as uh, most senior members of that group, uh, Thomas Peterson, Jesper Ryberg, there are people who have uh, done quite a lot of, of influential work in neuroethics and including uh, the topic of uh, neuro interventions in, in crime prevention. Uh, so, I, part of my choice of, uh, to invite uh, Sebastian to speak to us was uh, to promote neuroethics here uh, in Taipei. This is part of my, my efforts to do that. I, I am teaching a, a neuroethics class, uh, undergraduate class this uh, semester, where one of our sessions is on, is on this topic topic of neurocorrectives, and Sebastian is an early career scholar who is uh, doing uh, work on this topic, has already published a number of papers on it, uh, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing his latest thoughts on this. He's going to talk to us uh, today about informed consent and mandatory neurocorrectives. Sebastian, thanks very much for agreeing to participate in our seminar, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you to the School of Philosophy of Mind Cognition for hosting these seminars, and, and thank you, Alex, for the for the invitation. I've been really looking forward to to share some thoughts on um, of mine on uh, informed consent and mandatory neurocorrectives, because as you said, this talk will basically revolve around the question of whether neurocorrectives should be used without the consent of offenders um, or whether consent to these kinds of treatment uh, should be required, more than speaking that is. Um, so what I'm going to do for the next 45 minutes or so is to go through these bullets. So first I'm going to say a little bit about what I think we should understand with no correctives, you know, at least what I just term what I mean with no correctives. Um, then I'm going to go into uh, a little bit of discussion about the consent requirement, uh, how it's motivated, what the structure is, uh, and what the most plausible structure I think of this kind of requirement is. And after that, I'm going to, to go into some substantial so, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we, we're not seeing your slides yet. Is it? Are you going to show them afterwards, or because now we're not seeing anything? Oh, I'm sorry. So I haven't shared them yet. Uh, no. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So how's this? Coming. Yeah. Hey, are you seeing them? We can see them well. That's Thanks. good. Okay. So as I said, uh, after um, after having laid out a little bit of what I think the most plausible structure of a consent requirement to no corrective is, I'm going to go into some substantial stuff about how we can use argue in favor of a consent requirement both in the context of using neurocorrectives, but I'm also try, going to try to take some of the rationales sometimes seen in the uh, debates in medical ethics and bioethics more generally to see whether or not we can actually apply these sorts of, these sorts of rationales in the context of uh, criminal justice. I'm going to consider four different ways to do this. Um, but ultimately, I'm going to argue that it's not clear that they can do that work of actually undergrading a consent requirement to neurocorrectives. But then I'm going to take the discussion down one level from the level of abstract philosophical discussion. And then I'm going to try to defend really briefly why we might want to have a consent requirement um, given how dysfunctional criminal justice systems are around the world in terms of how they actually generally use mandatory neurocorrectives. And just before moving on to this, I should say that 
This talk is built around a paper of mine from Medical Ethics, Journal of Medical Ethics. Um, and obviously, I won't be able to go into all the nukes and, and uh, nuances of the arguments. But if you're interested, this is probably the way, the way to go uh, for that. OK, so what are new correctives? So when we discuss this the use of new correctives in, in the literature, the usual way to define them is something like this. We say that new interventions or new correctives are interventions that achieve or attempt to achieve its effect by directly altering the chemical and or neurological structure of the recipient's brain. And this context, obviously, with the aim of criminal rehabilitation. And we usually then contrast this to interventions that, while ultimately aiming at the same types of alterations of the brain, are somehow mediated by the subject's environment. Uh, and we call these indirect interventions. And usually, the work stops there. This is where we, we stop defining. Um, for one thing, for one thing, it's very hard to give necessary and sufficient conditions for when something is a direct intervention and when is it an indirect intervention. And in many cases, it's not. It doesn't seem that important. So I'm not going to go into that in this case either because it's not that important for us either. But what I do think is important is to get a sense in more practical terms of what I have in mind when I talk about no correctives and what I, when I talk about indirect interventions. Um, and I thought that a good way to do this would be to tell you a story. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you a bit of a story here. Um, to try to illustrate what kinds of interventions we have. Imagine a criminal offender, and let's call him Daniel. And suppose that Daniel is in trouble with the law. Again, because Daniel suffers from a lack of impulse control which means that he reacts violently to what he believes to be provocations, and he's often quite unable to, to explain afterwards his reasons for acting the way he did, um, or even control himself. So now a, the judge in Daniel's case is trying to figure out what kind of treatment would be effective to um, oblige Daniel to receive either as his punishment, alongside, or in addition to his punishment. Again, there might be important, um, might, this distinction between whether or not a no corrective is a punishment or is not a punishment is quite important in other contexts. But I think for now, we can just leave that uh, aside and just consider what kind of treatments might a judge want to meet up or oblige standing to receive. At least. One type of treatment, which is quite commonly used in many jurisdictions in the US and uh, some parts of Europe at least, is for, the, for Daniels to be obliged to receive cognitive behavioral therapy. So this would be where Daniel, either individually or in a group, is provided with tools to help him control his impulses, uh, different types of techniques that he can try to use to control himself when uh, things get critical. And in public speech, these are sometimes referred to as anger management programs. And they, as I said, they're quite common in, in at least some jurisdictions. Let us suppose that this is not likely to be effective for Daniel, or we might even suppose that Daniel has already tried this sort of indirect treatment and it doesn't really seem to take. Or suppose that there just are more effective ways, the progression of science means that there are more effective ways to help then. What kind of treatment might this be? More precisely, what kind of new correctives might a judge consider in Daniel's case? Now, before moving on to this, it's important to stress here that this will obviously depend on Daniel's particular neurological makeup, right? what is the reason for why Daniel is acting the way he does. And obviously, most importantly, perhaps, or at least as importantly, the progression of science. Um, and some of the uh, examples I'm going to mention uh, are definitely not at a stage science-wise in which we will want to use them yet. But I'm going to, going to give you them as uh, examples anyway. But here's definitely one that uh, 
is far along in science, right? Because suppose that Daniel's imp a lack of impulse control can be determined to be a symptom of an untreated ADHD. Then treatment with something like uh, methylphenidate and Ritalin or the like, uh, or similar psychopharmaceuticals could perhaps be mandated to him and that will be effective in helping him gain or regain uh, impulse control, thus ensuring he won't um, end up in trouble with the law again. But suppose that's not the issue for Daniel. Um, suppose instead that his lack of impulse control, his aggressive impulses can be are suspected to be due to a deficiency in the serotonin levels in the brain. And some scholars have speculated that treatment with something like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is usually what's used to treat depression and the like, uh, might be of use to correct these levels. I suppose, again, it's not likely to be uh, useful for Daniel, it's not likely to be the most effective way, but instead, novel kinds of brain stimulation techniques, such as transcranial direct current stimulation, or deep brain stimulation turn out to be. So some studies, again, do seem to suggest that this might be a viable way down the line to uh, aid uh, individuals with lack of impulse control to regain impulse control. But again, the science is unfair. And finally, it might even turn out that it will be sufficient to find the right nutritional balance for Daniel. So some studies do suggest that given vitamins and mineral supplements to some subjects at least may reduce aggression in, in those subjects. So we, ha we have here a range of more or less uh, speculative neurocorrectives that might be used to reduce uh, Daniel's propensity towards violence, given that this is what, what, would, it, what actually help him and so on. I think it's important to note here that, that none of these techniques I just mentioned are, as far as I'm aware, used mandatorily in any criminal justice system around the world. So no one is being uh, mandated to receive treatment for ADHD or, or treatment with um, a brain stimulation technique. Um, but given the progression of science, this might definitely be something that criminal justice might find interesting to secure criminal rehabilitation. It's also worth pointing out before moving on that there are in fact some uh, treatments that would qualify on our definition of neurocorrectives as neurocorrectives. Um, in some jurisdictions, um, individuals, particularly those suffering from opioid addictions, can be obliged to receive methadone treatments to, re to treat that addiction. And in some jurisdictions, those individuals who are found to be criminally responsible yet suffer from uh, a mild case of psychosis might be obliged to receive antipsychotic treatments. And I think most importantly for the talk today, in some jurisdictions, um, some sexual offenders uh, can be mandated uh, treatment with libido reducing drugs. That is what I'm going to refer to as chemical uh, castration which isn't used, as I said before, in some jurisdictions, particularly in the US. Okay. So having now said something about what neurocorrectives are, what I mean when I refer to neurocorrectives, I think we can move on now to say a little bit about the consent requirement and its structure. So, what I'm going to do now in this part of the talk is to say something about the content of the consent requirement, how it's motivated, and so on. And I'm going to start by doing this by giving you another type of story. This is a more traditional form of philosophical cases, right? What I'm going to do, I'm just going to pick the cases and then I'm going to comment on them afterwards. Okay. So take first sclerosis shot. So during a visit to a physician, Elena is offered the injection of a novel drug, which will ensure that she does not develop multiple sclerosis later in life. With an understanding of the possible benefits and side effects of the treatment, as well as those that may result from refusing it, and without being influenced by others to do so, Helena declines treatment. Now consider aggression shock. 
Andy is serving his third prison sentence for violent assault, and he's offered the injection of a novel drug that will reduce his level of aggression as part of an effort to reduce the likelihood of him reoffending. With an understanding of the possible benefits and side effects of the treatment, as well as those that may result from refusing it, and without being influenced by others to do so, Andy declines the treatment. So I'm presenting these cases to you because I believe that the main motivating intuition, at least, behind uh, defenses of a consent requirement in your correctives is the belief that there is a moral symmetry be these, be between these types of cases. So that is, whatever values we believe are important to protect in sclerosis shops with the use of consent are equally important to protect in aggression shop. So therefore, if we want consent in Helena, in uh, the disclosure shot case, we surely also want it in the aggression shot case. That's the intuition of this. And I think that's intuitively quite plausible. So sometimes when this view is presented uh, in the literature, it's just stated something like this. If they say, defenders of it say, of the consent requirements say, no correctives should only be used on criminal offenders, provided that they give their informed consent to this treatment. And this has led some uh, critics of the consent requirement to read or understand this as a uh, absolute view. As it, that is, they understand it as though the claim is that the consent requirement can never be uh, justifiably set aside, regardless of what consequences it might follow from not doing so. Um, and personally, I don't believe that this is what defenders of the consent requirement have in mind. Uh, so I do think that the critique on this point is a bit unfair. But I think it's worth saying a little bit about why we should not understanding, uh, understand it as an absolute reading. So I'm just gonna go back to our cases real quick. So in the case of, uh, there's one asymmetry between the cases between uh, sclerosis shot and aggression shot. And I believe it to be that in the case of Helena, the primary bearer of the negative effects of refusing the treatment is Helena herself, right? However, this is not the case in aggression shop. So when Andy declines the treatment, the primary bearers of the possible negative effects of this is his future victims, right? So I do think that we want to say, if, if we modify the Helena case so that uh, actually she's not being vaccinated for something that is primarily something that will harm herself, but she's being vaccinated for something that will primarily harm something, so, so, sorry, uh, would primarily harm others to a great extent, then we would be inclined to say that this might be permissible, right? We, we at least we're inclined to say this uh, when it comes to the area of, uh, of bioethics, that, that, that uh, the public health ethics part of, of medical ethics, right? That's the, the standard view is that if an office at stake, then it is permissible to override or to infringe on someone's um, informed refusal. And I do think we want to say something similar uh, in the case of Andy. But if we do want to say that, then it seems to follow that it cannot be an absolute view that we adhere to when we want to defend a consent requirement to new correctives. So, as I said before, I do think that the critique of defenders of the consent requirement, which reads it as claiming uh, that the requirement that is absolute is a little bit unfair because I don't really believe that that's what they have in mind. But they're not clear on it, so it's fair enough to, to point it out that it's, it's ambiguous on what they have in mind. So I do think that a more plausible way, a plausible structure of the defense of consent requirement should probably take something like a threshold view. At least this is one way to do so that avoids some of the, the problems that I just pointed out. Maybe to say that, well, if enough good is, good is at stake, then the consent requirement can be justifiably infringed. 
Because if we adopt this position, then we won't be in the situation of having to uh, swallow a lot of um, implausible implications, which are the ones I, I talked about before. Then we can just say, well, those cases you talked about before, in which there's a great harm to others, are extreme cases. These extreme cases, we should indeed, um, uh, we, we can indeed justifiably infringe, infringe on a consent requirement. That could be set aside just justifiably. And the same is the case with some types of, of offenders. I, if, if what we suspect they will do is going to be very, very um, bad and, and it's the only way to prevent it, then that's just fine to use no to use a no correctives on them, even if they dissent or they don't want to uh, receive it. But in normal cases, they can claim using a threshold view. In normal cases, consent is required. So this would be a way for them to fight that much of the critique that's been made against the consent requirement. The thing is though, and this is what I'm going to argue for the next part of this talk, is that even these moderate defenses, more moderate defenses relying on a threshold view um, are not that persuasive upon uh, scrutiny. So particularly what I'm going to do in the next part of this talk is to argue that it's not obvious that mandating new correctives are morally worse than other acts within criminal justice that we do not require consent for. Um, and thus, it's not clear that these moderate defensives uh, succeed. So while considering these four different ways we might want to try to motivate uh, or undergrid the um, consent requirement, I should just say that during this, I'm going to assume, which is in line with how the discussion is, is usually had, uh, had, that the new correctives in question will be effective, that, that, that is, they will work, and that they will be used on offenders in, in which it would actually help them uh, not commit new crimes. Also that the background conditions are just, that is, that they are actually are guilty of something they have done, that the prison sentence is not, uh, the punishment is not too harsh, and the prison conditions are uh, up to ethical standards. Um, these are, of course, not the case in most criminal justice systems. And I will return to some of the issues with a dysfunctional criminal justice system in the end of the talk. But for now, the discussion is going on an abstract philosophical level of discussion, as it, as it is in the literature, usually. Okay, so why might we believe that there should be consent to medical treatments and can we actually use these types of rationales in the context of criminal justice to argue that there should be a consent requirement to neurocorrectives? So the standard view in bioethics and medical ethics, as you all know, of course, is that um, Informed consent must be obtained for medical treatments in order to respect a patient's autonomy. And whatever else good there is to say about this view in the context of medical ethics generally, I think it faces the challenge in the context of criminal justice that we usually accept uh, considerable restrictions of offenders' autonomy in criminal justice as we do not usually believe that informed consent is needed for incarceration to be permissible, for example. So there is quite a challenge that faces those that want to defend uh, a consent requirement to no correctives on autonomy grounds. And this challenge is basically that they need to point out a ethically relevant difference between the autonomy, the autonomy and mining effect of traditional responses to crime and new So the traditional responses to crime might be incarceration, as I said before, which of course um, do restrict autonomy by restricting uh, rights such as uh, free movement and association and so on, right? <clears throat> so we need some way to, they need, need, uh, need to provide an ethically relevant difference. So it's just one candidate for a relevant difference. And in the paper I talked about before, I considered several more, but I, for this talk, I can only consider one because I want to do other stuff as well. So here's one candidate for a relevant difference in terms of autonomy mining effect. 
So one might say that neurocorrectives to a great extent and traditional responses to crime, such as incarceration, will undermine capacities necessary for a time. Um, as I said before, this is one kind of relevant difference, but, although I do think this is a quite a, uh, a standard one that people uh, argue from. I think we should acknowledge that this is going to be the case for some types of treatments that fall under the heading of neurocorrectives. So something like prefrontal lobo lobotomies and something like heavy sedation and so on will certainly be more invasive of, uh, on autonomy than, say, uh, incarceration. But I also think it's fair to say that many types of the neurocorrectives we're considering will not. Uh, and possibly some neurocorrectives will uh, enhance capacities for autonomy. So I think this is what we saw in the case of the story that I told you in the beginning with Daniel. Right? So insofar as we found a neurocorrective that would actually help Daniel regain or gain impulse control. <clears throat> this is possibly a way of um, helping him or enhancing his autonomy, at least uh, in my view. And given that this is the case, I don't think that this kind of relevant difference can do the work, at least not in terms of showing that uh, there needs to be a consent requirement for all types of neurocorrectives. It might be able to show that there should be those for prefrontal autonomies and heavy sedation, but I don't think anyone is really arguing that there shouldn't be. Okay, <clears throat> I'm just going to move on to another way that we might try to motivate um, the consent requirement for neurocorrectives. And as I'm sure you're aware, before respect for autonomy became king of bioethics or the king of medical ethics, it was not uncommon to make reference to the harm of patients for why we wanted to have consent requirement to medical treatments. Right? So maybe something like that could be used in the context of um, new practice, not of consent to new practice. That is, we might say that informed consent from patients to medical treatments is morally required to protect patients from harm, something similar is the case from the practice. Now, again, the issue is one of pointing out the relevant difference, right? Because there can be no doubt that traditional responses to crime, such as incarceration, for instance, um, do harm offenders. Again, being denied access uh, or be being denied the freedom to move about as you want, being denied the access to see your family and friends as you like, uh, doing as you like more generally, surely constitute a way of harming uh, the offender. And indeed, most would argue that insofar as something is to count as a state punishment, it must be harmful. So therefore, insofar as we want to tease out a difference between neurocorrectives and traditional responses to crime in terms of their harmful effects, we need to have an explanation for how neurocorrectives are likely to be more harmful or harmful in a specific way. And again, I'm only going to consider one, type, one candidate here there might be there are many others, um, but one kind of candidate for relevant difference is the following. So my, one might say that neurocorrectives are likely to be more harmful than traditional responses due to potential detrimental effects of meddling with offenders in the lives and is messing with their uh, brain, so to speak. Specifically, as some, has, as some have argued, uh, such meddling does carry the real risk of worsening offenders' mental health. Um, and I do think, again, that we should accept that this is definitely an, uh, a risk. So at least some types of neurocorrectives, such as deep brain stimulation, for instance, are associated with risk of depression, apathy, mania, and, and more. And some of the techniques I talked about or I presented in the introduction of the talk, uh, we don't really have a good picture of what the side effects of those kinds of treatments are going to be yet. So, so this might be a real worry. Yeah, right. I do think, however, that this way to motivate the view suffers from the challenge that there seems to be, or that studies have shown that to be a causal relationship between traditional forms of uh, punishment, of traditional responses to crime, and the worsening of mental health. So the most studied is the link between major depression and bipolar disorder and so on, and incarceration. 
and it seems the causal relationship seems to go from being incarcerated and then you develop these sort of, of, of issues. Um, and indeed, there has been some studies that have shown that even just being arrested, having the experience of being arrested by the police are associated with mental health risk. So again, I think we could claim here that at least in terms of that sort of candidate for relevant difference, it probably won't do the work. I'm just gonna move on here to what I think is a quite interesting way to try to motivate uh, the difference or to motivate or ground a consent requirement to new correctives. Namely, that some few people, not many, but some people in medical ethics and bioethics more generally argue that informed consent from patients is morally required to protect the proprietary rights individuals have over their bodies and their minds. So the self-ownership idea basically is that individuals have ownership rights over their bodies and of course their minds, which means that anyone trespassing, just like you would trespass on a piece of land, anyone trespassing on your body without your consent uh, is wronging you. Right? And I, the reason I think this, is, this might be very interesting for the current discussion is that it seems to have a pretty straightforward answer to why we would think that we should require consent to neurocorrectives, but not to other uh, traditional responses to crime. Because it seems quite clear that neurocorrectives necessarily manipulate what is internal to offenders. While incarceration, it might be claimed at least, changes only offenders' external environment. So inherent in the idea of, of self-ownership is that while you do have self, moral self-ownership or you have ownership over your body and your mind, you do not have ownership rights over the external environment. So you can't be uh, claimed to have a uh, experienced rights violation by someone changing the environment around you. It's a truth modification, but basically that is, that is the claim. I think this is an interesting way to go about it. I think the issue, however, is this way of cutting the cake, this way of saying that uh, the requirement of consent should track whether there are changes to internal, what is internal to the offender or what is, internal, or what is external to him, uh, squares quite badly with standard practices in a criminal justice systems, which we usually believe are permissible without obtaining our consent. So just to give you some examples here. Suppose that there is an offender that runs away from the police or refuses to leave the courtroom once he's been sentenced or he refuses to leave the bus to transport him to prison and so on and so forth. So I think most of us would say that it is permissible for offenders to apprehend the offender running from the police if they need to by force and restrain him. We would also say it is permissible for agents of the law to pick up the offender if he refuses to leave uh, the courtroom or if he re refuses to leave the bus to transfer him to prison. That is, it is permissible for them to pick him up and carry him where they want him to go. But if that is true, that those kind of actions, that is, they seem to violate self-ownership rights because they do something to the offender, right? They do something to him, not to him, his external environment. So we do, so we would need for this rationale to work, the rationale somehow must appeal to something other than the, state, the distinction between what is internal and what is external to the offender, or somehow explain the relationship between the two somewhat different. And uh, it, but it's, not clear, it's not entirely clear to me that, that they have the, that this kind of view have the uh, resources to do this. Although I'm, I'm going to leave that another question because it might be the case that they could actually do this. But, Instead of dwelling on that, I'm now going to turn to the last reason why, way of the last approach that one might take to defend a consent requirement to new correctives. Because sometimes in the bioethical and the medical ethics literature, trust is cited uh, as a reason for having informed consent. Particularly, it's said that 
informed consent for medical interventions is required because it's an important instrument for maintaining public trust uh, in, the medical in the medical system. And the point here being that if individuals don't trust healthcare professionals, the, the worry is that uh, they don't trust healthcare professionals to respect their refusal of an unwanted treatment, they, more, they might avoid contact with members of the medical system altogether, and this might obviously have possible dire consequences for themselves or for others. So we should try to maintain trust levels as high as possible in society, it's claimed. And, and, and this is best done by having full consent. And some have argued that we need to ensure that there is a sharp division between treatments and, and uh, the criminal justice system. So Tupan Chansi argued some time ago that uh, unless a sharp demarcation is made between punishment and care, then there's a definite risk that the trust in the healthcare system will be undermined. So the, basically, our question here is, should the potential negative effect of the use of mandatory new correctives, new correctives on public trust levels in the healthcare system have us reject uh, their use? So this is obviously, at this part of me, this is an empirical question, but I do think there's, there's still reasons here to, to just point out some issues with this sort of way of arguing. So the first thing I think we should know, note is that, technically speaking, only downward deviations from what we might call optimal trust levels in the society uh, seems to be morally problematic if we accept the view that trust is in, and informed consent is important for maintaining trust levels and, and so on. So the idea of optimal trust levels, at least this is what I argue, is that um, just as trust in a healthcare system might be too low, trust in a healthcare system might also be too high. So insofar as there is excessive trust, this might, for example, lead, lead individuals to accept the proposed treatment without considering whether this treatment actually aligns with their other values. And more generally, it may lead people to uncritically accept a problematic degree of medical paternalism uh, in which their own wishes and interests are curbed by medical practitioners. So if that is true, if trust levels can be too high, which seems quite obvious, then the optimal level of trust in the medical systems in any given society is such that it, among other things, ensure as many individuals as possible seek out its representatives when they are in need of aid, but simultaneously ensure that these individuals do not easily fall prey to medical paternalism. And if that is all true, then this implies that a decrease in trust is only worrisome to the extent that it decreases the trust below or further below that optimum level. So actually, this is just to point out that in order to argue from the position of trust for um, a consent requirement to more corrective, it's actually not just straightforward to show, it's not just to show that there are a, uh, a decrease in trust if we use these kind of interventions non-consensually or um, without consent. One must also show that the trust levels have, uh, are not above the optimum level. This is sort of a technical point, but it, I think it was worth ma making anyway. But I do think that it, is, it would be plausible to respond to me here that, well, sure, Sebastian, but isn't it the case that in most actual societies, um, trust levels in the medical system it is probably, if, if the problem not above the optimal level, likely a little bit below the optimal level or a lot below the optimal level, so that any decrease in trust from using mandatory neurocorrectives will reduce the levels below this optimum even further or just below the optimal level. And they might ask then, if this is the case, then surely this implies that we, uh, we should not use no correctives without consent, right? And I don't, I still don't think that the answer to this is straightforward. Because as I said before, this is obviously basically an empirical question. But I do think there's, there's some reason to doubt that we necessarily need to have a net loss of trust because we use mandatory no correctives in criminal justice. Because 
there may be ways to compensate for the loss of trust in the healthcare system, right? Just to name a couple of examples, there are many ways that scholars talk about how we could try to um, have the public have more trust in um, the medical system. But one way it's said is to disclose, disclose the level of patient satisfaction to the public, so the public knows how a good a doctor is, so to speak. And another one is to increase the transparency of the relationship between doctors and the pharmaceutical industry so that uh, patients actually know what kind of uh, drugs the doctor is pushing because he's getting paid for, by a pharmaceutical industry to actually do so. This is just to name some, a few example of, examples of uh, how we might try to counteract a loss of trust, supposing that there is a loss of trust when we use mandatory neurocorrectives. Then we might try to counteract it with other types of uh, measures. Um, so we can't really straightforwardly conclude anything about uh, this kind of rationale, I think. As I said, I think I said a couple of times now, this is ultimately, obviously, an empirical question. So in, in, regardless of what I'm arguing here, uh, our conclusion shouldn't be too strong. But I think that these are these reasons for uh, doubting that um, a rationale for, for informed consent to neurocorrectives can be placed on uh, the relation to trust. So just to sum up what I've argued so far, right? So I, I started out uh, the second section, I think, to talk to say something about why I think absolute defenses of the consent requirement uh, should be rejected. Also, I noted that uh, I think uh, at any rate, I don't think that defenders of the consent requirement are actually making such absolute claims at any rate. But I think we should look at other ways of uh, arguing for it. But then I argue that even if we accept that, I think the moderate defenders of the consent requirement uh, might not succeed. That's at least what I argued in the uh, this part of the talk. Right? Might obviously be other ways to motivate consent, but uh, at least these four ways of doing so is probably not going to do the trick. At least it's an open question whether they will or not. So this obviously, I think, prompts the question. Does this mean that we should reject the idea that the use of neurocorrectives uh, on offenders require consent? So my inclination is to say that when we are moving at the level of ideal theory or abstract theory discussion, I think, I think the answer is yes. I think we should believe that it does not require consent. I do believe that that's the case. Um, but I think the answer is the, quite the opposite when we actually look at how uh, it's, these new correctives are likely to be used in actual criminal justice systems. So that's what I'm going to do in the last part of this talk. And I'm going to argue, uh, I'm going to try to defend the consent requirement in the dysfunctional criminal justice systems, given some of the facts about how criminal justice systems generally use one type of no correct. And again, this is just going to be an example of how one type of neurocorrectives is used. It's obviously going to be an open empirical question whether or not the use of other type of neurocorrectives will have the same features. And I won't be able to motivate my, my view that it probably will. I'm just going to give you an example of how it's used and draw some implications from this. The case in point is chemical castration here, yeah, which I mentioned in the beginning of the talk that in some jurisdictions um, sexual offenders in, in particular can be obliged by the state to receive libido reducing treatments that is chemical uh, castration. I think however the issue is that when they do receive these kinds of treatment at least in many states <clears throat> where they receive this kind of treatment they do so only on the basis of an offense. So what this means is that when offender A commits offense X, that fact alone suffices to qualify him or actually he needs to be mandated uh, chemical castration. So in, in some 
this is a statutory that the judge has no say in this, whether or not that should be the case. It just follows directly from the fact that he's committed an offense. Now, I think it's quite obvious what the issue is with doing that kind of, of, of using no correctives in that kind of way, because this means that there is, there is no examination of the offender, whether or not this would be helpful for them. And there is, no, there is no assessment of the likelihood of this treatment, whether or not this treatment will actually reduce crime. And, that's, and thus, it's completely unclear whether mandating this kind of treatment actually prevents more harm than it causes. So that use, I think, should motivate us to believe that at least in some cases, there should be a consent requirement. Um, because if we use neurocorrectives, uh, chemical castration, the way I just described, then it's not clear that they, they address the underlying reason for why the offender committed the crime in the first place. He might just commit new crimes, or, and we might just, the side effects of the treatment might, be, might harm him for no reason at all. Right? So how may we how may require consent address this problem? Whether or not it will address the problem, it's obviously an open question, but here are some thoughts, right, at least. So I think that a consent requirement might constitute a pragmatic safeguard against ineffective and harmful use of new correctives by courts. So it might act as a pragmatic safeguard in the case that we just considered by ensuring that the offender can act on the basis of medical advice that he obtains himself, that he actually consults physicians or considers whether this is likely to be effective for him himself. Right? So we require consent in order for the uh, offender to actually be able to obtain the relevant types of information. So all in all then, just to round up this, right? And we may actually have reason to require consent for neurocorrectives if criminal, criminal justice systems, as unfortunately seems to me likely, will mandate such interventions in the way that, uh, in the way that chemical castration is often mandated. Let's go to the topic. Thank you.